repair. Hello, hello, hello. Hey. How are you, Ann? How are you? Good, nice to see you. Good to see you. So welcome to Jewelry Making and Repair. Every tour that I do actually starts over here at our cases. Uh -huh. So whether it's virtual or IRL. So we're gonna turn these good folks around and come over here. Very good. So all of the work in these two cases are examples of work done by students and work that's in the curriculum. So the case that we're in front of right now is all examples of our stone setting, everything from our most basic projects down here in front to some of our more involved projects at the back, which are done in gold, platinum, and palladium. And then we have examples of some of the tools that we use for that work as well. If we come around the corner to our smaller case, we have examples of things in the curriculum um, that are a little bit earlier in the program, a little bit more basic. So some of our tool making exercises, um, sawing and filing, um, some of our most basic stone setting. We're actually gonna be talking about this style of stone setting today, a little bit of engraving and then a really fun workshop seminar that we had last year that I hope to repeat in the future where we start to explore um, other unusual materials. So in addition to platinum, gold, palladium, silver, we've got some examples of Damascus steel actually in the case here. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's so cool. keeping up with all the interesting things that are going on in the industry. So obviously all this work takes place in this shop. So we're gonna take a little walk. Um, underneath the cases, you'll see these big messy trays. Every project in the curriculum, and there are just over 50, um, has an attendant project sheet and a series of samples. So this is an example of our project library. So all these trays in all their glorious mess are samples and uh, process pieces so students can see what we want to do as well as sometimes what we don't want to do. We absolutely embrace our mistakes. Um, most of the teaching takes place in this area here at the front of the shop. Um, our teaching bench is behind this monitor. Thankfully, we're not actively in COVID protocols right now, so students are welcome to watch demos on screen or at the bench, whatever's more comfortable for them. Our laser welder also lives up here, as well as some of our Gem ID equipment. As we move this way, Every shop needs a good sink, so this is our cleaning area. We have our pickle pot, our ultrasonic, our steamer. Some very fundamental mass finishing equipment. And then this is our soldering area. We're gonna be spending some time here today doing both some annealing and some soldering. Both the students and I are gonna be taking, taking the group through um, some projects and exercises. So we move this way. We have our draw bench, which is gonna come into play today. We're going to see that in action. We're going to see that in action today. Yep. Our forming area, some of our casting equipment and wax equipment. This is our grinding and polishing area. We take safety really seriously here. So uh, this is a setup for students to work with ventilation at our flexible shaft machines, as well as two of our stand up polishing units, all of them with dust collection. The anvils back here, which tends to be a big hit. Everyone likes an anvil. Or so, a pun. <laughs> so this is uh, one of the tools that we use for heavier, heavier duty forming, forging, etc. We're going to move into the student bench area now. So we've got some students at work. This central bay is where our first year, first semester students get started. Um, everyone is supplied with the basics. So a bench, a desk lamp, a flexible shaft, and fundamental hand tools, the tools that we would expect to find on a well-equipped jeweler's bench. So things like the pliers you see up here on the rack, uh, the mallet that's hanging out up there. Students also purchase their own consumables and measuring tools, so that we're gonna see those coming into play today. And as students get more settled in the program and they move into their second year, the bench setup gets a little bit more complex. 
So this is an example of two second year bench setups. Joanna is going to be taking us through some stone setting in a little while. But what you're going to see is she has a microscope. She has dedicated dust collection. So as students move through the program, uh, their tool needs change. Um, you'll also see that Joanna has a whole lot more stuff on her bench. So the process of accumulating tools happens throughout the entire, entire process of the program. That's great. And we have other work areas scattered here and there. But enough about the work areas. We have a schedule change today. I know we promised people ring basics. OK. But we changed it up. My first year students actually were a lot more interested in talking to everyone about chain making. So we're going to talk about our link chain project. Um, and I'm going to let Audrey and Bella, our first year students, take it away from here. OK, thanks, Anne. Hey, Audrey. Hi. Hey, Bella. Hello, how are you? Good. Hi. Um, I'm Audrey. I'm Bella. We're first year students, as Anne said. And we're actually going to move right over this way. Okay. To kind of start off, we're going to be moving around a lot. Okay. We'll do our best to follow you. Yes, it's okay. We'll take so, a little second. This is a nice little overview of what we're going to be doing um, making a chain link bracelet. So you can see it's a bunch of rings that are interconnected. And we make those rings over here from wire. That wire is then wrapped around a form. A coil is made. That's from wrapping. The coil is cut when we get these rings. And then the rings are put together into a chain. So that's an overview of what we're doing today. Um, something that we do in studios is order wire in thicker and larger gauges. It's easier to store and more versatile that way. So the first step is getting that thick wire to be thinner and a smaller gauge. Um, that requires some math, which is a brief um, picture of our math over here. I'm not going to go through it, but going back to geometry and volume, figure out how much of the thicker stuff do you need in order to make the right amount of thinner, longer stuff. But yeah. I'm curious to see what your process is here. The math? The, or the, 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 the make it going from thicker to thinner. The overall idea is that the volume doesn't change. And so you set the two volumes equal to each other, and then you solve for what's unknown. Cool. I could really geek out about it if you wanted to, but let's do the fun stuff instead. OK, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I guess All visual, right. too, is that this right here, this like nine and a half inch thick one, will get you about a meter of thin stuff, Right. which is kind of cool. All right, so we are going to move down this way. This is where the stretcher comes into play. So this is the drawing bench. Here is a drawing plate here. I'll get into that in a second. Okay. And then the draw tongs here. So we want to get to this wire here. So we kind of got an in-between for you guys. So this is 14 gauge and we want to move to 16 gauge. Okay. Um, so it did start here. We went to 14 and then I'll show you how to get down to this now. You don't have to follow me. I'll be right back. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, just putting those down. All right. So this is the 14 gauge. We want to move it down to the 16. So there is a little, um, a thinner area at the top here so that it can fit through the draw plate. So I'm going to start, show you this here. I'm going to start at 14. So this is the gauge where it doesn't fit all the way in. You see that there? Yes. And then if you go to the one before it, 13, it goes through. So we're choosing that 14 one where it doesn't, it doesn't go all the way through. Okay. Hey Audrey, what's that called? So, this? Yeah. The draw plate. All right. And then I'm going to grab the draw tongs. All right. 
Those are the manual drop-offs. Should I use the bigger yep. ones? Okay. Oh, so the, the tension of once you get those hooks on is is what yep. is what holds the other end of that piece of wire. All right. So then we use this bunch here. And it pulls it through. You want that it might bring up a little bit more. Yes, I would move the okay. large ones over. So then once it's through. We can measure it. Thank you. So we'll measure it here. So we want to move this down to 1.3, correct? So we're at 1.68 right now, and we want to move it down to 1.3. So we would just continue this process going downward. So then we would go to the next one. Four. Can we get measure? Oh, and I can see on the draw plate there's like a it's beveled or there's like a, a cone at the back a right? channel. Um, so you feed it in, it's easier to put it on one side and then draw it out the other yeah. side. Yeah. It's like that uh, It is. The princess <laughs> You have to make sure this is secured so that it doesn't. So once it's connected in here, this tightens and closes. Right. Uh, so sometimes it. Oh, someone's asking on the chat uh, what the material is here that we're using. That we're using. This is sterling silver. Sterling silver. It is. Yeah. And sterling silver is a very specific alloy. So any of the jewelry nerds in the house will know that it's actually 92 and a half percent silver. The balance is seven and a half percent copper for hardness. All right. And I don't know if you'd be able to notice this, but this is much longer than what it was to start off with. It is. For our audience, it's absolutely much longer. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to put this through another time. We're at about 1.4 right now. We want to be at 1.3. So a theme here, again, patience with the process. This is all about... Um, small increments. Small increments. Definitely. And you can imagine it was, it took much longer when it started at 10 days than when it started. And tolerances. I think what's interesting about today, going to violin making and coming to jewelry making and repair, both programs, I feel like, uh, use some of the highest tolerances uh, because of the work that's done here. Absolutely. In this shop, we maintain tolerances uh, below a tenth of a millimeter. So it takes time to get there, but those are the expectations that we work with. All right, see how much further I have to go now? Because it has, has gotten much, much longer. All right, perfect. It's at 1.29, so now we can give it the so next one. step is we take this wire that has been thinned out and we wrap it around and make a coil. Because this has been stretched, um, it's been work hardened um, and it would need to get annealed before using it. So for time's sake, we actually already have an annealed piece. Uh -huh. And we'll talk about annealing more in depth later. Um, process of heat treating it so that it is um, softer again so you can actually bend it. So now what we're doing is making a coil. Here's a sample coil in copper. Um, we use this form. This is actually a transfer punch. It transfers a um, center to another piece, but it's not what we're using it for. Okay. <laughs> um, we're using it as a solid base to wrap the wire around. Um, and we use a vise to keep things still, and it's pretty simple. You just pull and wrap. 
Um, so you want to make sure it's stable in there so you have bent the edge so there's contact between the wire and the mandrel we're using. This is a specific diameter, it's 3 16 um, because that is the specific coil size, the interior coil size diameter, diameter we'd like. So again, this goes back to the math on the board. Um, you have to calculate what size rings you want, how right. many rings you want, what the inside diameter of that ring is, what blank you would cut for that, and how many. Um, so I find that stuff kind of fun, <laughs> but it's also not fun for most people. No, it's fascinating. I, t um, I worked on the retail side of jewelry and often wondered about how things are made and why. And, and I feel like even though I've been here for quite some time, I'm learning so much today uh, about, about this process. It's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, the two key words for making the coil is out and down. You really want to stack them. And what you don't want is any space in between each of the coils. And so in pulling down, you're putting pressure on the link below in hopes to reduce there being any chance of being space between each wrap. It's amazing how malleable the material is. Yeah, we'll talk more about annealing in a moment, but um, it's that hardening and annealing is that process, or hardening, most people have probably experienced with a paper clip. When you bend a paper clip back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, it eventually breaks. Right. So you've work hardened it, and it's become harder, but it's also become more brittle so you can't work with it as well. So that process of heating, annealing, gets things back into the right uh, orientation to be malleable and soft again. My hands are getting sweaty, which is not helpful. <laughs> It looks cool just in its form like that. I feel like I could put that on something and... It's actually a way uh, you can make really primitive tubing huh. just using a coil. And it's worth noting, while Audrey winds and winds and winds and winds and winds, that sterling silver, even though I mentioned that it has this copper additive for hardness, sterling silver is actually really, really soft. So Rob, you are observing that it's moving really easily. Mm -hmm. Sterling silver is one of the metals that actually moves really readily. It's great for, for students because it's fairly uh, forgiving, uh, as opposed to some of our gold alloys, which can be really rigid and really springy. All right, so we're getting to the end here where it gets really complicated, and you have to do this little dance. And what you'll probably see as Audrey lets go of the pressure on this mm -hmm. is rather than the coil springing like this, the coil actually compresses downward because she's been putting that downward pressure. It closes up gaps. Oh. Hopefully. Hopefully. Oh, there it is. Nice. All right. Now we're going to actually move on over to the solder station. Okay. To get some heat on it. Beautiful coil, Shanae. Cool. All right. So, and it's just getting everything started for us. Okay. Uh, we're going to anneal this. And I know we haven't really talked about it. We've said annealing a lot, but haven't really talked about it. So annealing is when we heat the metal for a specific amount of time at a specific temperature. And it changes the 
crystalline structure in the metal. Um, the atoms in the metal almost um, move away from each other. It kind of makes a malleable, ductile um, piece of metal that we can use much easier. Um, and then as we work with it, it gets work hardened. We might have to anneal it again. It's kind of just a back and forth process. So with this, instead of with just like a regular wire, we don't want to heat directly on top of it because we want every single um, one of those jump rings to get heat in the center, on the outside, everywhere. So Audrey is actually going to heat on the charcoal block okay. and around the coil. Um, and that'll make sure that every single bit of this gets annealed because the worst thing is when you have half of it annealed and half of it work hardened. And do you have anything to add? Um, so, oh, go ahead. Just what I put on there, it's called Plus. Okay. It has two functions. It protects the metal from getting too scorched. And it also is an indicator. So it, uh, it changes with temperature and it can be our thermometer and it can let us know what temperature we get to. Because we want to get to 1100 Fahrenheit. Um, that's the temperature at which sterling silver anneals. Perfect. Yeah, the only other thing I would add is uh, the medium that these folks are working on. So different materials require a different substrate. So this is charcoal, and we use charcoal for very specific reasons. Like now the, fire. Sorry? I said now fire. Fire. <laughs> <laughs> Now that I'm on camera, it's going to take seven times. So what Audrey is lighting is what's called a dual fuel torch system. So we have natural gas and oxygen. And her striker is giving her a little bit of trouble today. Believe it or not, lighting a torch is one of the skill sets that we have to really learn. It's not as easy as it looks. So this is just gas right now. OK. And now we're adding oxygen. And you'll see it gets more of a firm shape to the flame. And it gets, a, it gets two cones. There's the inner cone and the outer cone. We want a flame that's neutral, slightly reducing, um, which has that yellow little tip of the inner cone. All right. And like Bella said, I'm going around getting the block. The block, charcoal block is really heat absorbent and helps distribute the heat evenly. The next step after this is quenching. So I'll be putting this hot thing in this thing of water, which needs to be done carefully in a tube like this because, oh, it's starting to, all right, there we go. It might, uh, if I were to do it upright, it might shoot. Right. <laughs> we appreciate that. <laughs> all right. So that's annealed and you can see it has some kind of gross stuff on it from the flux. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens now is we walk over to the sink area. Okay. And it goes in the pickle pot. The pickle pot. Pickle pot. Which is a beautiful crock pot. Um, and it's a warm liquid with acid in it. Okay. And that helps get rid of any oxidation and any junk from the flux. Perfect. Um, instead of waiting for this, we actually have one already annealed and pickled at my bench. So we'll just head back this way. I know oh, we're that's moving. Great. I know we're moving everywhere. No, we're good. We like to. We like the activity. All right. So here is the coil. And today I'm going to be using um, this piece of wood right here as a dowel, and I'm going to put this on here like this. This is a not necessary step, but definitely a helpful one. It keeps it nice and stable. It's hard um, to get dependent on this though, because you might not have the right uh, size of wood to help you out. But for today, I'm going to use that. 
And I am going to use a fresh saw blade. So I have a fresh four out saw blade here. If you're gonna hear it here, it's nice and um, secure. So I'm going to show you how we would put this in. So you wanna make sure the teeth are going downwards. It's like the bench test. Yeah. This is the bench test. <laughs> Not the jump rings, but the soft rings. Right. right. And you want to tighten this in here so it is nice and tight. All right. So you kind of want to make sure you are getting the most amount of coils possible as you do this. So um, you want to start at a place that makes sense. Like right at the end of that curve. That's what right. you're looking for. That's how I'm doing it. The hardest part is holding it steady and still. Right, and getting it started. Once it's started, it's a little easier. So I'm just going to cut a couple of these. You want to make sure you're moving your fingers out of the way. All right, and if you see, I'm going at kind of an angle so that I'm starting the next one. Oh, yeah. As I'm working on the one I'm working on. And then your dowel is just collateral damage. It is, but then you can kind of move this up forward so you don't completely destroy the dowel. Cool, they stack up on the saw blade. Yeah. That's, I was just going to ask. Yeah, so. As they fall off, you get these little rings. So cool. Sorry, I've zoomed in a little no, bit you're here. Totally so fine. All right, so here are some examples of the rings. These ones have been soldered already. So we have some soldered here, so they're closed. And then this one is not. Um, we just chose the copper here so you can see the difference um, and that. really see the length. So this is when we start to put them together. So you would take two soldered links and then the unsoldered link and, and open the unsoldered link just a little bit, kind of the smallest amount you can to fit these both on there. I'm getting the sense of the value of jewelry, you know, like beyond, much beyond the material itself, the amount of work that goes into right. creating beautiful pieces. We often joke that there's a reason jewelry is expensive and it's not just the gold. <laughs> All right, so I just closed that up and now we have the start of a chain. So what would happen next is we would solder this right here. So this is also um, secured and Anne is actually gonna show us that. Yeah, so that'll be our last step in the chain making demo. And then we're going to switch gears to some stone setting with Joanna. So okay. we're going to head That's back great. to the soldering area. Thank you. Thank you so much. So soldering is one of the most fundamental skills that we learn as jewelers. Um, and so soldering, what we call soldering in the jewelry business is actually brazing. The difference between soldering and brazing is temperature. I'm not gonna geek out too, too hard about that, but just to say that we're actually working at brazing temperatures here. So the first thing that we need to do for a successful soldering job is have a good setup. So good soldering requires three things, cleanliness, fit, and even heat. So this jump ring, you probably can't even see on camera, has a seam right here, and it is light tight. Can't see any light through that, there's no space. Because soldering is a process where we actually melt an alloy, and it flows into the crystalline structure of the material itself. So we have expansion under heat, we have this material that melts and then it actually wicks through capillary action into that expanded crystalline structure. So it takes a fair amount of control to get this to happen. So get this set up 
I have my two solder jump rings down here. I need to make sure that my solder seams are facing down in a way so I don't accidentally re-solder those and make a big, a big lump of jump rings. And then I'm fixturing this in a little heat proof pair of tweezers. This is what's called a third arm and it's exactly that. It allows me to hold pieces so I can have two hands free for other tasks. I'm going to add that flux that Audrey was talking about earlier. Again, flux acts as a detergent and also keeps the surface clean. So this is part of that cleanliness piece of the equation in soldering. And now I'm going to go ahead and add the solder to the equation. So if you look down here, these little chips, we call these pallions. And these are pallions of hard solder. So hard solder melts and flows at a very specific temperature. Actually, it's a temperature range. Um, and hard solder has the highest working temperatures of any of our solders. So we have hard solders, medium hard solders, medium solders, and easy solders. So this is, this is going to melt and flow at a relatively high temperature. Um, the pallions that I'm using here are actually about two to three times larger than I need for the job. I just cut them really big so that folks could see what we were doing. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and get the torch lit. So one of the things that I mentioned earlier was even heat. So solder, while it responds to gravity, also responds to temperature. So I need to make sure that the temperature of this component is consistent on both sides of the seam. If it's hotter over here, the solder is going to flow towards heat. Hotter over here, the solder is going to flow towards heat. So I have to follow a really specific procedure to get this entire link to the correct temperature in order for the solder to flow. This is a little bit more complicated in highly conductive materials, and both copper and silver are highly conductive. So I'm going to use a technique called pick soldering. I'm going to introduce the solder into the equation with this pick. So the first thing I do is I melt my little pallion, and then I just pick it up. And then I'm going to start heating the tweezer. Because the tweezer is what we call a heat sink. It's actually sucking heat out of this equation. Oops, sometimes gravity works against us. There we go. And I'm watching my surfaces to give me a sense of when the solder is flowed. So what you can see here is there's still a big old solder goober on there. But what I could see is the solder actually flowed into the seam, which is going to be absolutely impossible to see on camera. But what we're following in these situations is a series of visual cues. So our, the color of our metal, the surface of our flux, and then hopefully we can see the solder flow right into the seam. So this is going to head to the pickle pot. I'm going to stop at the pickle pot on our way over to Joanna's bench, where she's going to take over and show us some cabochon stone setting. That's great. Thanks, Anne. And, and uh, I just want to say thank you for, uh, to our audience here. I'm, uh, I'm trying to do the best I can with, uh, <laughs> with keeping things visual here. Joanna's right over here. Oh, great. Hi, Joanna. Hi, Rob. How are you? Good. So welcome. Welcome to my crib. <laughs> yes. Um, today I'm going to show you how we hammer set a bezel. So there's a couple different ways we can set a bezel. Like I said, we're doing hammer setting today. Okay. Um, and this is the piece that we're working on. Um, I have it fixtured and ready to set. And it doesn't look like much, but when it grows up, it's gonna look like this pendant. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, so this is a variation on the first stone setting project we do in the curriculum. Okay. Which is a split shank cabochon ring. Um, this is the one that I made. Um, and we've got a couple specific components that we're working with here. We have the bezel, which is actually surrounding the stone and holding it in place. We have the ornamental wire, which is just there to look pretty <laughs> and to surround the bezel. But then if I show you our split apart one, you can see inside there, we have a little seat for our, um, for our stone. Oh, cool. And the seat is just another jump ring. 
that we make and we put in to, um, to give support to the stone so it doesn't break during the setting process. Um, and in this, um, in this scenario, what it also does is it raises the stone above the level of the ornamental wire so that I can actually get in to all of that metal and push it against the stone. So um, the other thing that we really care about among those components is the fit of our stone into our bezel. Um, and the reason we care is actually seen in this pendant. Do you see how lopsided that is? Yes. <laughs> so I set this stone yesterday and I was so proud of myself. It was going so smooth. And then I stopped and I looked at it and I was like, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> um, so what happened is my bezel was too big for my stone. So when I was pushing the bezel in, it kind of levered this part and it pushed up the other part, if that makes sense. So I like pushed it in and levered it up. I see, I see. Um, and I had to like come in this morning and I was like, oh my God, Anne, what did I do? <laughs> um, and it's apparently a very common mistake, which makes me feel a lot better. Um, but this is why we need a good fit. <laughs> so in case you ever wanted to know. So that's our bezel. And then the stone that we're using, um, it's the same one, same type of one as here. Um, it is a American Mind Amazonite, which is a feldspar. It has the most hardness of six to six and a half. Um, and it's in the same family as Labradorite and Moonstone. Okay. So it's got that same kind of like pearly shift to it that those tend to have. So that's our bezel, that's our stone. And then, like I said, we have our setup here. I have my little bezel fixtured into jet set. Okay. And we just use basic jet set here. And what it is, is it's just plastic. It comes as these little beads. And so if you pour warm water, hot water on it, it mm -hmm. becomes malleable. And then what we're able to do is push it over over our piece and then oh. once it solidifies then we have a secure thing that we can put into the vise to actually do our setting um, so it helps to protect our piece from the actual setting process and in this curriculum we also pre-polish all of our pieces so that if i do my setting right um, it'll protect that polish and then all i'll have to do is clean up my hammer marks once i'm done with the actual setting so um, so then let me tell you the process and then I'll show you how it actually works. Great. So what we're gonna do, I wrote you a handy dandy little thing here. Thank you. You're welcome. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna tack it in eight different spots. So north, south, east, west, northeast, southwest, northwest, southeast. Um, so we're gonna tack it in those eight spots around the bottom and that's gonna hold the stone into place. Then we're gonna go around um, with our hammer setting tool, do one row, do one round around the bottom. Um, and that's gonna snug the stone um, into the bezel. Then we're gonna do another round, which is gonna start bringing the bezel down over the stone. Then we're gonna do a final round around the top. And I realize I'm saying round a lot, I apologize. That's fair. <laughs> uh, and then that's gonna finally bring the bezel down onto the stone. So you do this in stages. You start at the bottom and kind of secure this, then move up to the next layer, secure it, almost like it's not really a zipper, but, but from bottom kind to of, top. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, we, and we can't do one until we do the other. Okay. Like I can't just jump into um, hammer setting the middle part, like without tacking. It's just, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna be secure. Okay. So it's very much all about the stages. Um, also, a tip from me to you, um, don't try fitting your stone into your bezel too soon um, because you will get your stone stuck. Yeah. Um, so I have set four different cabochons in this program and I've gotten two of them stuck and I've had to drill out the back to push the stone out and that's really traumatic and I don't recommend it to anybody. Okay. So when your teacher tells you not to test the fit of your stone, don't test the fit of your stone. <laughs> so I'm just gonna come over to the vise right here. Okay, great. So we've just got our little bezel and our little stone. Does the height of the bezel have any effect on setting, Joanna? It does, thank you for mentioning that, Anne. 
Um, so you can't really see in this drawing, but pretend you can see in this drawing. Pretend right. I drew it really well. Um, <laughs> so the stone has a point where it breaks. And that's where it comes up flat and then it starts to round out. Mm -hmm. And the point where it breaks is where it's starting to kind of round out. Okay. And what we have to do with our bezel is we have to come just above the point where it breaks so that we're holding it in. Because we can't, if we just have this straight square bezel, like it's not gonna do anything. We have to bring it over that rounded point a little bit to like actually hold it down. So does that make sense? Yes, I'm following. Okay, thank you. All right, so this is the hammer we're gonna use. It's really thrilling. It's like, is she gonna break her stone? Is she gonna hit a finger? I've done all of them, so it's possible. Oh, good. <laughs> we are alive. We are alive. So this is my brass bezel pusher. Um, and like I said, I'm just gonna tack the stone. You can also do the full setting process with the bezel pusher. Um, I honestly find hammer setting a lot easier um, because I feel like I have more control which is very odd. It doesn't seem like it would be that way at all. But, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start tacking. Yeah, thank you for sharing your process here. You're welcome. Thank you for being along on the journey. So I just tapped it in those four spots. Now I'm going to come around and do another four. Okay. And this is all just human power. The metal is soft enough that you can tack it. Yeah, so you can just push it in. So I don't know if you can see that. We'll pick it up on camera. But I can see it here. Yeah, I don't know. Little flat spots mm -hmm. from where I tacked it. And then we get to the fun part. All right. So this is my hammer setting tool. This is the one I'm gonna use. Um, you can see it has a little flat face to it, um, which was pre-polished so that it won't leave any extra marks. Okay. Onto our piece. So you polish the end of your tool. Yes, because you're, because it'll act as a stamp, okay. basically. So any scratches or anything that are on the end of our tool will stamp into um, into the metal that we're... That makes using. sense. I'm going to sidetrack you for a second. Where did you get these tools? Oh, I made these tools. You did? Yes. Not the hammer. Okay. Not the hammer. <laughs> um, yeah, I made these and my bezel pusher. Um, it's one of the first things we do when we start the program um, because we need to use a tool throughout the rest of the program. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just take... Um, round stock and we cut it to length and then we do all the shaping to it and then we polish it and then we use it to set stones or break them depending on the day. Very good. <laughs> all right. So what we do, so for the first round, I'm just gonna hold it flat to the end and I'm gonna tap and kind of move it as I tap. Okay. okay. switch with you. Okay, sounds good. And I can hear these changes in tone and it makes me wonder like uh, you listening, you know, you kind of have a feel of like what is this sound? Oh my gosh, the first time I did a hammer setting, I was like tapping it barely because mm -hmm. I was so scared. And Anne was in like the other part of the shop and she came over and she's like, "I can hear what you're doing. You're never going to move the metal <laughs> <laughs> with that light of a pressure." And she was right, of course, because she's the teacher who knows everything. But. And I mean that lovingly.
So that's our first round. Um, my stone is still moving, so I didn't do the greatest job. <laughs> that's but okay, but it's not broken. It's not broken. I didn't break a finger, I didn't break a stone, and sometimes that's all you can ask for. So, so that's the process of how we set, um, and then once we're done, I'm going to continue and finish setting it. Okay. Um, but once we do that, then we just have to go to our cleanup steps. And for that, we use our little pumice wheels. We have medium and fine pumice, and mm -hmm. these are just to remove the scratches left from the hammer marks. Um, and then we go over that with our red rouge compound, which is just iron oxide. It's just a pigment. Um, and I have a couple of different little wheels to show you that I use. Um, and this just brings that shine back, makes it, makes it all pretty. Um, and you have to choose your, um, your abrasives and your polishing steps carefully, depending on the hardness of your stone. Okay. We're kind of skirting the line here because Amazonite is six to six and a half on the most scale. Okay. And Red Rouge and Pumice are in the same area. So it just means- So you have to be careful. Yeah, so it just means you have to like mask your stone while you're doing it. Okay. Um, but it's really the only thing we can use. So it's like, but we make it work. So. Good. Yeah, so that's how you hammer set. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I, it's it's wild to think you know you're polishing the end of your tool uh to to kind of not have any impact but then you still know there's still going to be some and this, so there's a whole process set up afterwards uh to bring this to you know it's uh as beautiful as it's going to be so it's very cool thank you so much for sharing the the process with us thank you for joining me for the process yeah um, I'm always curious, uh, because we are an accredited career school, um, what, what are the job prospects um, that are out there for bench jewelers? Can you talk about that a little bit, Anne? Absolutely. So um, the job prospects for a North Bennett Street School trained jeweler are excellent, and the options are really, really varied. Um, as a, for instance, Joanna is entering her fourth semester and she's actually starting her training at her internship over the next couple of weeks. So Joanna already has potential employment lined up and she hasn't even graduated yet. And the truth is that's not entirely uncommon. There's a huge demand for bench jewelers um, and they work in all kinds of different um, environments. So everything from uh, small wholesale manufacturers to bench jewelers in the back of a store um, perhaps a more specific task in a larger production environment like stone setting. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our curriculum is actually over 50 projects. So we start with the basics of fabrication and we move into stone setting uh, in the first semester, faceted stone setting in the second semester. So after their first year, students are prepared to enter uh, a number of different uh, arenas with basic skill set. Uh, by the time they're done with their second year, um, they're really prepared for employment in a lot of different, a lot of different environments. Um, so as I say, we have people working for large manufacturers, small manufacturers. Some students do aspire to self-employment. Uh, so we have students working uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurially excuse me, as designers. So the, the, the opportunities are, are quite varied. That's great. And I, I feel like uh, jewelry making repair here at North Bennett Street School shares uh, with the rest of the programs here, we really require in so many ways that people have a focus uh, to work with precious metals, to want to do stone setting. At the same time, as you go through the curriculum, as you get experience, you may be introduced to something that maybe you, you weren't sure uh, that you had an interest in or that there's a job opportunity. I'm thinking of things like engraving or yep. so many other things. Yep. Can you talk about people's process there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you can be a generalist or you can be a specialist or you can be both in this industry. Um, it's very interesting. Historically, uh, a lot of shops were run with a jeweler, a setter and a polisher. Um, so there were three people doing those three separate jobs. You don't see it as often anymore, but that certainly used to be the case. Um, and we introduced those three skills. Um, so all of our students have skill setting, fabricating, polishing. Um, we do introduce some more specialty things like engraving. Our engraving is very, very basic. We actually don't go into decorative engraving. 
but certainly decorative engraving is something that is, um, it's a niche. Um, it's actually a very profitable niche because there aren't a lot of hand engravers around anymore. Um, so certainly your training at North Bennett Street does start to touch on that. Um, same is true of stone setting. So I like to describe the, the curriculum as being circular rather than linear. Um, we start with very, very basic skills. So Joanna was talking about her stone setting tools. And there we're talking about measurement, we're talking about layout, we're talking about three-dimensional thinking as we reduce material using um, generally files. Um, from there, we move into uh, the addition of forming and soldering, et cetera, et cetera. So as we move through the program, the skills that we learned in those first projects in those first months are still at play in the last months of the curriculum. We're just honing our skill in those areas and introducing new concepts. So everything is, they're building blocks. Um, so you start here and your skills grow and grow and grow and grow, and you're always honing those initial skills throughout the entire process. That's great, thank you, Anne. And a question came through uh, from our audience here um, where I think the question was, uh, if you have a fine arts background, um, how does that play into thinking of coming in this direction? So um, a number of our students have actually come to the program with a fine arts background. I'm included on that list. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about my journey and what that meant for me and what it's meant for, for students. Um, so I, uh, graduated from art school with a double major um, in metal smithing and jewelry and ceramics. And I knew that I wanted to focus on jewelry, um, got out into the world and realized very quickly that I had a really wonderful grounding in design, but I didn't have the grounding in technique. I did not know how to make the pieces that were occupying my brain. I just didn't have the skill. I didn't even, they didn't even know where to start. So I came to North Bennett Street after actually graduating from art school and working in the business for a little while because I knew that I needed more concrete skills to realize all of the things that were living in my head. And that's, a, that's an experience that a lot of our students coming from art school share. So a North Bennett Street school training is an opportunity to grow the technical skill set that allows you to execute the complicated designs that live in your brain. So that art background is, is helpful, but absolutely not required. Um, because North Bennett Street, first and foremost, is a technical training program. We're learning very, very specific, tangible skills in order to execute our work at the highest level. Thanks, Anne. And what, what are things that you look for in uh, candidates that you believe will be successful here in the program? Um, and out in the world as bench jewelers? That's a great question. Um, one of the things that is uh, really important is a little bit of patience um, and attention to detail. Now, both of those are things that frankly can be learned. I think all of my students, I'm gonna look around, can agree that they're starting to learn a little bit more patience and a little bit more attention to detail. Um, but uh, that, as, as a, that is a really excellent um, starting point. Um, what else? What else? I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask my students. What's important? What's important to be a successful student here at North Bennett Street? Thank you. Patience is, is key, and the, uh, the persistence and knowing when to continue doing the same thing or have to change what you're doing. Um, I know I I didn't come here with any jewelry experience. I was a science teacher. <laughs> um, so those thinking to apply, um, it's more the desire and the seriousness in, in wanting to do it and wanting to spend the time um, and the energy and the hours upon hours upon hours of doing microscopic little movements to get it just right. Yeah. Thank you. I'd say, I'd say one of the main things is the ability to stick with it. Um, for long periods of time, no matter what's kind of going on, you just kind of have to stick with it and work really hard through the problems. Um, and that takes a lot some days, um, but it's really, it's really nice to feel like you just had a long day, you worked hard the whole day, you were um, attentive the whole day. I think it's really just a longevity thing, um, and it's really rewarding, yeah. That's great. They kind of stole my thunder, but I was going to say dedication, um, but also the ability to remove yourself from your work. Um, 
I know I have a tendency of like all my self-worth is wrapped up in my project. Um, and so if it's doing bad, if it's not going well, then I'm a bad person. Um, and so one thing that Anne teaches here is observation, not judgment. So if we're looking at a ring that I'm making and my stone's loose, it doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It just means my stone's loose, you know? Um, and so that ability to, to start to remove yourself from your work just to the degree that it isn't infringing on your self-worth mm -hmm. is something I've definitely had to learn here. And well, yeah. That's a, it's a great point. And I feel like when, when you were uh, showing us your demonstration, you know, even joking about, uh, you know, breaking the stone or something like that, <laughs> I can see, you know, your, um, your progression in this way, I feel like your comfort level. So, so, th so that's very nice. And, and I, I really appreciate our, our visit here today. And I hope that our audience, um, also, uh, had the ability to kind of visit us in a very safe way, learn a lot about jewelry making and repair at North Bennett street school. It takes patience. It takes dedication. Uh, it takes so, so many cool things, a technical passion, I think. Um, and uh, the results are just amazing. Um, this is some of the highest quality work, I think, that's, that's done probably in the world. I'll go ahead and say that. Um, you're at least set up with a foundation to do that work uh, for a lifetime. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much um, for sharing with us. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.